The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. And good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone, and welcome to the final session of this 12-week uh, course for training on the PowerPixel Point system. My name is Scott Dunlop, and I'm the head of training for the PowerPixel Point system. And uh, so within this session, what we're going to do is uh, pick up where we left off. Uh, we finished off with inventory in our last session. We got all that through all that stuff. So within this session, what we're going to cover is, first of all, the mail pull-down menu. That won't take long to do. And then we'll finish off with everything under the products pull-down menu. Quite a lot of content within that as well. And uh, within that, that being said, um, can I just make sure if, if uh, you can just check on your screen, tell me if uh, your, your audio and video is working fine, uh, just to make sure that uh, everyone's able to see me and hear me. Just uh, someone give me a little bit of input on that. Can anyone let me know? Can you hear me or and or see me? Okay, audio is fine. Cannot see your screen. Okay, there we go. See, it's always a good thing to do something like that. All right, let's try that. And can everyone see me now? That's better. Very good. All right, good. It's always good to uh, to check that. Great. Well, welcome everyone, and uh, glad to see everything's working fine. All right, so let's get started with this. The first thing we're going to do is jump over to the mail pull-down menu, and within here we've got uh, some mail functions within this. And actually, before I get into this, what I want to do here is I want to get the front end working here, just so I can quickly jump back and forth between the two, and we can see what's going to happen at the front end when we do this. Now, while this is starting up, the mail function, this is basically an internal email system, so to speak, but don't think email is in conventional email. Uh, wait, break now, log me in, remind me later. Okay, so there we are within this, and I'm going to go back in the back office again. Okay, the mail function basically allows you to send mail messages back and forth from, well, not back and forth, to some degree you can, uh, but mostly from the back office to people at the front end. So what we're going to do here is just take a look at the mail function and select on send mail. Now, within send mail, we have, um, oh, I cannot see you. Okay, uh, let's just make sure. Okay, my, my, uh, make sure everyone here can see me. All right, I'm, I'm just going to try this one more time. Make sure everyone here can see me. So hopefully there, everything uh, will be working fine. And I'm going to pick up where I left off then. If you do have any problems where you can't see me or you do need to get some kind of message across to me with regards to that, uh, please use the question function within your uh, presentation system. Okay, just uh, send off a question to me and that will flag on the system there. Okay, so, good. All right, so within here, what we're going to do <clears throat> is uh, send off a mail message. So coming into this, let's take a look at what we've got available to us. First of all, on the left-hand side, we have mail to, and you can send to an individual person. Okay, so down here, I'll have a list of all the individual staff members. We also have by job position. If I select on that, then everything within here will show by everyone within a job position. So if I send to this one, I can send to a specific person, to this, everyone within a specific job position. And finally, to everyone being all staff who are on file, they will get this message. So you can send to any one of those. All right, coming off to the right-hand side, we have three types of messages we can send off to. All right, the first one here is a mail message. The second one is a broadcast message, which is just a short bulletin thing. And the third one is response mail. Now, the first one I'm going to show here is a broadcast message, just a short message that, boom, it'll just, here's a quick message I'm going to send across. And I'll say, for example, here, get back to work. Okay, so I have something like this. I'm going to send this to everyone on the system. So send, there we go. Uh, mail sent to the destination. Now, from here, if I was to go into the front end, which I will do right now, you'll see within here now I have this message that shows up on my screen, get back to work, which is what I just sent off to everyone. And so no matter where the person is in their transaction or even if they're not logged in, but as soon as they do log in, then this message will come up automatically. 
And now if they're in the middle of, of placing an order or something, this will interrupt it. But in here, you just read the message, click on OK, and you continue on with what you're doing. It does not interfere uh, with anything beyond that to that extent. OK, the next thing we're going to take a look at is the mail message, conventional mail message. And in here, I will say, for example, uh, Friday night. And I'll put within here, I need you to work Friday night. All right, and on this, I will send that off uh, again to everyone. All right, and send. Okay, send to destination. Now, again, if I uh, minimize on this, here I am now on the front end, and I have this mail message that came up. Now, as you can see, a mail message, first of all, you can give a title to it as well. There's a subject matter off to the right-hand side. And then down below, I can put in a lot more information than what can fit within like a quick little one bulletin thing that we had in the last one. So in here, I could put in all kinds of information on this. They can read all of this. And when they're finished with this, then just select on OK, and they continue on with what they're doing again. Uh, once again, if they're not currently uh, logged into the system, as soon as they do, this message will come up for them uh, the moment they do that. OK, the last one I've got is the response mail. OK, so again, to everyone, and response mail. And again, I'll get into... Friday night. And in this, I will say within it, I need uh, two waiters and a bartender for Friday night. Can you work it? Okay, so what I've done here is I've now asked a question within here that I require an answer from, from staff on this. Okay, and I'll send this off. All right, closing that up, I'm going to minimize on this. You'll see now I've got this message up on the front end here where it comes up <clears throat> again with the subject of Friday night. And in here I have, I need two waiters and a bartender for Friday night. Can you work it? Down at the bottom, instead of having an OK, I now have a yes and a no answer. And so on this, as all the staff go in and they review these, these messages that come up like this, then they can enter in yes or no on this. And then they continue on with their work as, as normal. Now, Coming back into the back office, let's say now I've got all my staff and they've gone through and a whole bunch of people have actually responded to this. So what I can do now is go into the second function here, which is view response mail. And in here, I have subject and I can say open response file. Now in here, I will have a list of all of the different yes, no response uh, messages that were sent out and are still outstanding on the system. So here I have that one Friday night. And I'll select on that. And as you can see within here now, it identifies on a per person basis who has said yes and who has said no to the question that I asked regarding can you work Friday night. And then from here I'll know, okay, I can book the supervisor and, and Sally and, and Jane to work on Friday night. But, you know, Fred and Bob and Susan can't. So whatever the case, then I've uh, put that within there, and I can work with it from that. When I'm finished with this, um, two things. If, I, if there's still more answers to come in, then I can just close this off. It will remain uh, active on the system. But when I'm finished with it, and I've got all the answers I need, then I can just select on Delete Subject, and from here it will remove it from this response file and also remove the question from everyone uh, who may not have answered at the front end as well. So that is the, um, the mail function within PixelPoint. All right, now let's go over to the last of the pull-down menus, which is products. And in here, everything pertaining to menus and products will show up within this. And I have activated all kinds of other things that you may not normally see within here through the policies as well to make sure that we have a full extent of all the information that's available. Now, where I'm going to begin actually will not be at the top here, but I'm actually going to come down to this one first, which is summary group setup. Let's take a look at this. Now, summary group is a very broad grouping of menu items on the system for things like food, bar, beverage, that kind of thing. So that if you want to see, you know, what are my food sales for the day? What are my bar sales for the day? Then you can run a summary group report and all the stuff that qualified underneath that grouping would then be tallied up into that one total boom, here's all of your bar sales, here's all your food sales for the day. Now that being said, within this, we have a bunch that are already created in here. Bar, beverage, food, other, and rated. Rated being a rental item. Now in here, uh, we can work with just these, and for most places, that's fine. But if you did need to add in additional ones, just select on the plus sign to create additional ones as well. Now, up at the top here, we have the summary group description, so the name of the summary group, pretty straightforward. Underneath that, we have report type, and take a look, we have all these different groupings down here. Now, what you can do is you can group multiple summary groups together into these report types, so that when you generate a, 
a summary group report, then actually you will have the report type showing up as a, a collection total of these various summary groups. So let's say, for example, I break off my summary groups not by food, but by hot food and cold food, for example. Then I can have a summary group of hot food, a summary group of cold food, and I can have them both indicated as food within the report type. So this way, when I generate a summary group report, I'll have one total for hot food, one total for cold food, and then I will also have an overall report type total for both of those groupings, everything that, that, that qualified underneath that one grouping of food as well. So you can actually use it for those kind of things. All right, coming down to the next level is report category. Now, report category is the next level down from this. Let's say, for example, within food, I break up my food into things like chicken, I, uh, chicken dishes and pastas and the kids' menu and stuff like that. So all the subgroupings uh, within each one of those summary groups would then qualify under a report category. Now, within a report category setup, you'll notice that there's a lot more programming that's involved in here rather than just assigning a name. For example, I have appetizers up on the screen right now. So anything that qualifies as an appetizer in my particular database uh, then can be associated within all of this. Now in this, uh, first of all, I have associated the report category of appetizers to the summary group of foods. So that way, whenever our, my totals are being tallied up, then all of my appetizers will be included in the food total within the summary group. Underneath that, we have re revenue center. Okay, So if you are working with multiple revenue centers or profit centers, then you can assign different report categories to different revenue centers as well. Underneath that, we have the default print location. Now, everything from this point <coughs> down, excuse me, um, basically what we're doing here is we are doing programming for all of the items that qualify within this report category. And so what's going to happen is basically it's going to save us a ton of programming because all of the items that we associate to this report category will inherit all of this programming down here. And so for example, let's say all of my appetizers. The default print location I have is kitchen. Now if I select on this icon here, I have a list of all my print channels that show up on the system. And in here I can say the print to the kitchen and the appetizer and the salad printer or whatever it's going to be like that. So you can have multiple selections in here. And whenever you order any of these items, then they will all order to the designated uh, destinations that you have for this report category. Now that being said, the, the reason we do this is that if I have, let's say, five salads and, and eight soups and a whole bunch of finger food and so like that that all qualifies as appetizers. I don't have to identify on a per item basis where they're going to print. All I have to do is say they are appetizers and then from that they will all print to the same location being the, the, the kitchen printer. Uh, the same applies down the left-hand side for the taxes in terms of what taxes apply to that. So if I have five salads, for example, all of my salads are probably going to print to the same location. All of my salads will probably have the same tax applied as well. So I can apply it here and just have them inherit that. If I do need to override that, I can do that on a per menu item basis, and that's within product setup. I'll show you that later on. Also, with that being said, coming over to the right-hand side, I have default modify screens. Now, one of the things that we have within our order screen is a modifier page grid. Okay, And what happens is this is a dynamic, um, the contents of this is dynamic, in that based on the item I've selected, the modifiers that are available will change to accommodate that given item. So for example, if I order a food item, let's say a salad, then I will have the contents of the modifier grid will change to things like food holds, food extra, food modify, for example. If I ordered, let's say, a pizza, I may want to have an extra page in here for pizza toppings or pizza modifiers or something like that. So you can make it change on a per report category basis that whenever I order an item that is like, for example, is an appetizer, then all of these will show up. Now, if I chose something, let's say, uh, like beer, okay, now here I have beer, and it will print to the bar. It has different taxes, and take a look at the modifier screens, I now have bar extra, bar hold, modify. So if I order a beer on the system, then it will look at this program and say, okay, here are the modifier pages that you're going to use, here's where it's going to print, and here's the taxes to use as well. So in here is where you put in all of this common programming for all those items, and they will inherit that as they're assigned to that report category. Coming over to the right-hand side, we have schedule. Within schedule, I can actually program in uh, schedule pricing within here. Now, take a look. I've got schedule A through J. There are 10 price levels that are available within Pixel Point that you can play around with the, the different pricing on it and so on, as well as not present as well, meaning it's not available at a certain time. Now, in here, this is the fourth of the four areas where you can apply price levels uh, within the system. 
is uh, is by report category. So the areas that you can do it is you can do it by a station. So for example, I order a burger on station one. It can be different from the price on station two. I can also do it by member group as well. So that if I'm a senior, I pay one type of price. If I'm a VIP, I pay another price. And then also you can do it um, by report category. <coughs> excuse me, which I've shown you within here as well. And the fourth area is. I went blank on that, <laughs> but there's four areas, and uh, let me see, there's the station, and there's uh, a member group, and there's the time schedule, and gosh darn, I'll remember what the fourth one is, and I'll tell you what it is when it, when it occurs to me. I had a brain burp on that, but sorry about that. Anyway, within here, if you want to do something, let's say, within beer, okay, and I want happy hour, for example, uh, very common within a lot of uh, uh, restaurants and so on where maybe at you know from eight o'clock till nine o'clock on Monday to Friday for example they want to put in special pricing for their their beer so I can do something like this now when I create all my beer items I can have the discounted price of the beer on price level B okay which we'll take a look at when we get the product set up and what this will tell me is that all of the beer items when it comes to this particular time of the day okay there's Monday to Friday and there's 8 p.m. to 9 p.m right within that little slot there, then they will kick over to price level B, just for the items within that report category. And if there's a happy, happy hour, then there's price level C. So I can come in here. Actually, it may even extend it a little bit further as well. I can go price level C for that. Also, if beer is just not plain available before 6 o'clock at night, then I've, I've got not present. And if you want to just remove that capability altogether, then I can just say within here, you know, whatever time you want to take it out and there the item will not be available now it will actually sh the button will show up on the system but it will have a line through it on the descriptor indicating that this item is not available at this time and uh, you can hit on it but it won't do anything on the system it's not until when it actually kicks in that it then will be made available to order on the system so that gives you an idea of some of the things you can do with that one other little uh, word of caution before I finish off with this if the establishment is open past midnight let's say for example Saturday night and we're open till two o'clock in the morning and I want to have uh, happy hour pricing from uh, eight o'clock on so what I can do here is I can go down and I can select on that and that means up till midnight then it will be on happy hour pricing. Now, if I'm open till 2 in the morning, I'm actually not going into this time here, but actually I'm now into Sunday. And so you want to actually continue it on with the following day at the early hours of the morning. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're doing your scheduling past midnight. All right, finally we have within here printing priority. Now, one of the things you can do as far as... Uh, arranging the order of things to print out both within the kitchen and on the customer receipt as well is uh, by report category so this way all of my appetizers are grouped together all my beers are grouped together and so on and within this I have a print priority and what this means is that this will allow you to say which grouping will show up first which grouping will show up second which grouping will show up third now the way print priority works is as follows the higher the number the higher the priority all right, so just think, reverse the logic in terms of, oh, priority number one is the highest priority. We actually did it the other way around, and the reason being is that whenever there's modifications to a menu, then there's always going to be something higher that comes up. Now, if I set, for example, my steaks as maybe print priority number one, oh, steaks got to be first. But then later on, they came up with lobster, and, they, and the chef says, you know what, I don't care about steaks so much as lobster now has to be number one. Well, if you've already used up number one, then you really have to do a lot of shuffling around. But we reversed the logic and said, okay, so the higher the number, the higher the priority. So that way, if I gave my stakes a, a, a priority of nine and my low-end stuff a priority of one or two, then I came up with lobster, then I can always go to a level 10 or 11 or 99 or 999. You, there's, there's, you have a lot more flexibility in terms of coming up with more numbers that are available to you this way, and you can... Uh, it's a lot easier to work with uh, adjusting uh, printing priorities that way. So that being said, if I did want my beer to always show up on, within my beer, my, my bar prints, for example, and I wanted to sort sort through my drinks that way, then I can give this maybe a, a print priori priority of 9 or a, a 5 or a 55 or 555, whatever it's going to be. You know, you, you work out as far as what level, number of levels you want to work with on this. But in any case, the higher the number, the higher the priority.
Okay, so we've gone through summary group and report categories. So summary group, the higher end, report category, the next level down. Okay, now what we're going to do is come down to the next level here, which is product setup. Now within product setup, there's all kinds of stuff within here we have to cover, and I want to jump right into it right away. So let's let's get to it here. Now within here, I've got um, as appetizer. This is actually kind of like a, a comment that can be added into the system. I want my my big bowl of salad, but as an appetizer, or I want my spaghetti dish, but as an appetizer, or something like that. And you can do things as, as appetizers, main course, add them in, just to help identify where things will be on the order. Uh, you can use it or you don't have to. But in my particular one here, I'm just going to come on down to uh, banana split. Okay, so I've got a banana split on the system, so I programmed this into my, my menu. Let's take a look at all the stuff that we've got within here. First of all, I've got description being banana split. And now the description that shows up within here, this has the most number of characters available to it. And the reason being is that this is the description that will show up on the guest check. The guest check is in a smaller font. And so when you print it off, you can put in the full name of, uh, I could say, Scott's Amazing Banana Split or something like that. And I'll have a lot more characters to work with that way. Now the next one down is printed description. Now when you use this one, this is what shows up on the remote print, being, for example, the printer at the bar, the printer in the kitchen, that kind of thing, uh, where the person, the prep person is going to be making it. And in this, you'll have fewer characters to work with because you use a larger font for those types of prints. But that being said, you can also use some kind of a, a briefer description that would be more applicable or more understandable to the person making that particular dish. If you're ever working with a customer who uh, maybe they, they all speak English and is an English restaurant out of the front end, but all the staff in the kitchen may be from a foreign country and English is not too good, you can always kind of split things around as well and put in some kind of a, um, a different description, L, banana, split, I, I don't know. You know, but something like that. You can put in something like that where they, they would understand it better, or you, even if they, they don't even understand that, they may be uh, like, uh, like Chinese or Arabic where they, they use a symbol-based language and you can't really put that in there. Then you can always do something, uh, for example, like uh, number 12. You know, they would have maybe a sheet in the kitchen where they would know, okay, so I look at number 12 and they've got something printed off in their language that they can understand what it is. And in any case, the printed description will not show up on the guest check, the description will show up in the guest check. Okay, so you can use different things of, of that nature. The next thing we have down here is the button description as well. Now, this is what actually shows up on the order screen when the order taker is, is taking it. Now, if I have, for example, all kinds of banana splits on the system, then I may want to change around the wording of, the, of this as well to make it very quick and easy for them to be able to identify the appropriate banana split they're looking for. Um, and so if that's the case, you can use different... Uh, description within here as well to do that or a briefer description you know and if there's only one banana split then you can put in B A N S B L or something like that if that's something that they can quickly identify as being a banana split on the system again this will not show up to the customer this is what shows up on the order screen all right now when you are entering in something for the first time if you put in banana split at the the first field and you press the tab key it will automatically populate printed and POS button as well with the same description. If you do need to change those, by all means, you can do that as well. But just as a quick time saver, you put in the first description, hit tab, boom, those three fields will now be populated with the same descriptor. All right, coming over to all this information here. This all has to do with the uh, presentation of this button on the order screen. Now, first of all, we have this little thing here that says use grid settings. If you have this checked, then basically it will default to whatever you've programmed within Form Designer. Remember Form Designer to create your screens and your button displays and so on like that. If you select on that, then no matter what you put in here in terms of the colors and the, 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 uh, the way the positioning of the text and so on like that, it, it will, will disregard all of that stuff and it will default to whatever you program within the grid for um, that this button is used on within Form Designer. However, if you uncheck this, then you can now program this on a per button basis in terms of what you want to do with it. The text color, so within here I've used white for example. The background color, okay, you come up with a palette, you can choose all the different things as well. And the background color, you can uh, put that in there as well. I've got kind of like a, a khaki or a a sage type color on this one. Also we have button font as well so I can select on this and choose different fonts that uh, you can uh, use for your, your different buttons. Also we have button image as well and so in here I can load up an image 
of uh, whatever the item is going to be and and it would show up within here and that can be applied on there as well also we have our alignment of text as well in, by in older systems it used to be just the top left corner that's the way it was but now we can do some alignment in terms of top center and bottom vertically and top center and bottom horizontally as well so you can position the text anywhere you want on this button all right I, I'll just jump back to where we had here all right, coming down below that, we now have price levels. Now, as I mentioned here, we have 10 price levels on the system. You populate the first one and press the tab key. It will populate that, that same price across to all of the other fields as well. So this way here for my banana split, if I had a, a happy hour for banana splits, for example, then I may want to say, you know, $4.99 uh, whenever the banana split happy hour takes place. And so in which case then, that can it will kick over to that price level in that particular case, or I may want to have my my seniors pricing, my student pricing, my VIP pricing, and so on like that, uh, all set up within here. Uh, coming down to uh, the very bottom, we also have one here that says modify price as well. Now modify price basically saves you the need to create an additional item when you're using this ordering item as a modifier. What do I mean by that? Let's say for example I had a house salad, a chef salad. Okay, and normally you can Order chef salad for two ninety nine, and uh, and there you go. You've got your, your chef salad. Now, if you order the steak dinner, you can add on a chef salad for one dollar extra. So in this case, if I, if this was let's say the chef salad, I may charge two ninety nine, you know, across for all these prices, and then the modified price is a dollar ninety nine uh, within here because when it's used as a modifier within a force question, then it will use the modified price or it can use the modified price. You have full control over whether it uses that or not, but that's available for that as well. This is also really helpful for things like pizza toppings, for example. Uh, here, I'm just going to cancel on this, and I'm just going to come up. I saw anchovies. Well, there's bacon there. We could probably look at bacon. Yeah. All right, so here's bacon as a pizza topping, uh, for example. Now, on the system here, I've got, I charge $1.25 for bacon on any pizza. The modified price is set to zero because within the force questions, I can also have it set to use a modified price. I'll explain that when we get to force questions. But in that case, then I can have a free topping. So that's just something to consider down the line. Uh, I'll, I'll explain that in better detail when we get into force questions. All right, coming back to my banana split here. Uh, the next thing we have here is report category. So coming off the right-hand side, you select on the appropriate report category for that. Within here, I have a list of all the report categories I created on the system. And remember, when you select on one, then it will inherit all the things in terms of the modifier order pages, the taxes, and where it will print. If the desired report category does not exist, oh, I'm in this and I'm, I forgot to create the stupid thing, then what you can do is select on this little uh, box right here, and it will actually allow you to not only select on these, but new item. I can select on this. It brings me into report category setup. I can create the thing on the fly. And then when, I, with the, when I'm done with that, oh, there we go. And then it will be added to this list. I can select on it, and it will be applied within here. So you can actually create those report categories on the fly that way. Convic configuration category is a new one that I've added in as well. I will talk about that after I finish all this stuff. The next thing we have here is type of product. Now within here, I have a whole bunch of types of products available on the system. I recommend you go through the manual just to kind of get a good uh, handle in terms of what each one of these does, but I will very briefly talk about what, what each one of them does. The first one here is ordering product, which means anything that's a food or beverage that's on the menu uh, that you would order and has a price to it, that is an ordering product. So a salad, that's an ordering product. A hamburger, that's an ordering product. All right, the next thing we have down here is option. Option is a modifier. Okay, so for example, the you know, you can add cheese to my hamburger, so that would be an option. Um, or a salad dressing, for example, or how you want something made, rare, medium, well done, that kind of thing. Those are all modifiers or options on the system. You select on that, and what will happen here is that that will change how it appears within the check, how it is also appears within the printout as well because the modifier will attach itself to the master item it's been ordered with. For example, a hamburger with cheese or a salad with a salad dressing. And wherever that item prints, that modifier will follow with it as well, and it will be indented on the, on the printout. The next thing we have here is kitchen command. Now, a kitchen command is basically a command that can be sent across to a remote print, be it the kitchen or the bar or whatever. And within here, it's kind of like just a message that will be sent across to the prep person. It will not show up on the check. 
Okay, so for example, a kitchen command can be something like C server. Okay, I ordered something and the customer said, well, I want this on the side and I want a little bit of this, but a lot of that and so on. I have all kinds of different description within here. Too much to put on the check, so I just say, I select on that kitchen command says C server. So that way the person who's making this thing will come out and say, okay, what is it the, that's the, the particulars about this order? And then I can verbally exchange that to you that way. Another thing we have here is busing command. Okay, busing command is for bussers, basically, people who do the cleanup of the table, replacing the cutlery, that kind of stuff. You may recall within the front end where I've got the send command uh, on the table layout screen. You select on table, or on the send command, it asks for a table. I select on the table, and I come up with a window that shows me all of my busing commands. And so by selecting on this, I would have things like clean table, fresh cutlery, replenished water, anything like that. And these busing commands will only show up within that window. Uh, you don't have to apply them anywhere else on the system. Seating position. Okay, within seating position, if you are working with seating positions, seat one, seat two, seat three, at, at any given table, then you can create a seating position button. There's a few variations you can do with this as well, but basically, it will allow you to identify seat one, seat two, seat three. It'll automatically increment itself as you select it multiple times on the system. And then within here, uh, then when you're placing your order, I can say seat, and then it'll show seat one. I can order the items for that seat. Seat, I'll hit it again. Seat two will show up on the check, and I can order the items for that person. So this way, when you take it out to the customer, then they, you won't have to say, who ordered the lasagna? I'll know it goes to the person at seat number two, for example. Rated per hour product. This is a rental item, okay? So we can do things like bowling alleys and golf clubs and mechanical bowls or whatever it is you want to offer as a rental within the establishment. By selecting on this, then you give it a price, and the price is on a per hour basis. What the system will do is that when you order it, it will start cal uh, calculating on a per minute basis in terms of how much you're going to be charging for this. So let's say, for example, you and I go and we, we're going to shoot some pool, we're going to rent a pool table. Uh, so we select on the pool table, and that starts the rental on that thing. If we play for half an hour and it charges $60 an hour, then we'll pay $30 for half an hour worth of playing. Um, or if we go for 45 minutes, then it'll be $45 uh, you know, for 45 minutes or something like that. It will break out the hour uh, appropriately based on whatever price you put within there. It will calculate out for you. The next one is delay print command. This allows you to kind of affect when things will print off on the remote printer. So for example, things like um, I can create a button, uh, let's say delay five, okay? And uh, so that will be the name of the product and the type of product here will be a delay print command. It'll have a zero dollar price. So what happens is um, I, I place an order and I order, uh, let's say a soup and a salad and then I hit the delay five button. And then I choose steak, pizza, and then I hit the lay five button, and then pie and cake. So when the thing prints off in the kitchen now, what will happen is the soup and salad will print out, and that's it. That's the end of that print. Five minutes later, the steak and the pizza will print out. Five minutes later, the desserts will print out. Okay, so that's what the delay print does. It actually breaks up the check and puts in a time delay on this. And you can set these delays to whatever you want. The delay time is set on the advanced tab, and I'll explain that further as we get into it. The next one is merchandise. Now, merchandise kind of allows you to use the system kind of like a retail type uh, application where you're working with barcode scanning. Okay, so I've got a barcode scanner on my station, and I have an item that has a barcode on it. I want to scan that item. Let's say, like, it's a shirt, a hat, a newspaper, a pack of gum, whatever it's going to be. Then you can use it, set up as a merchandise item, and again, on the advanced tab, there's actually a field in there for putting in the UPC code for that. The next one is minimum charge. Okay, Minimum charge is basically a minimum charge that will be automatically applied to the bottom line of the check. So let's say, for example, you and I go to a club, and they have a two-drink minimum uh, policy. So that means just for you and I to sit down at a table, it's going to cost us $20. Now, from there, we order a cup of coffee. Okay, now the minimum charge has already been applied onto the, onto the system, so we're paying $20 no matter what, that's the bottom line price. We order two coffee, and a coffee is, let's say, $2 each. So that's $4 uh, that we're going to pay for our coffee. The minimum charge will now adjust itself to $16. We're still paying $20 just for the two of us to sit at the table and drink a cup of coffee. Now after that, we order a beer. Okay, beer is $5 each. 
So that's now $10, your $5 beer, my $5 beer, so that's $10 on the check, plus our coffee, which was $4 for the two coffee as well. So that now comes up to $14. Minimum charge adjusts itself to $6. We're still paying $20. Now, once we order something else and we surpass that $20, then the minimum charge will be reduced to zero because we've passed the minimum charge amount, and it will just continue on showing, you know, tallying up uh, what we order from that point on. Ticket number. Ticket number will basically uh, sh allow you to put a, t uh, a number, uh, apply a number to the check. Okay, so for example, we have a drive-through, well, not really drive-through, let's say a drive-in uh, type establishment where people just pull up with their car, they come up to the counter, I want to order uh, a hamburger and french fries and a milkshake. And uh, so I put in a, a ticket number, one, two, three. Okay, and say, okay, here's your receipt, and there's your ticket number right there, one, two, three on the system. And then whenever I got the order ready, then I'll just get on my speaker and say, now ordering, order up for number one, two, three. And you'll hear that, you'll take a look on your thing, and you can uh, you know, present your, your ticket, there's the number one, two, three, here's your order. Okay, so you can apply a numeric number that way, and it will prompt you on the system in terms of the number that you're applying to it. The next thing we have here is covered charge. Covered charge is an admission fee. Uh, for the establishment. Let's say, for example, one thing that's very popular right now is movie theaters where uh, they want to put in restaurants and little kiosk applications and so on like that. Lots of food service stuff within uh, multiplexes and so on. That being the case, it'd be nice if the point of sale system also allowed to uh, put in things such as uh, admission fees so for people to get into the movie theater as well. That's where you use cover charge for something like that. Or maybe in a nightclub, for example, uh, where I may want to break it off that a cover charge you know, for ladies versus gentlemen, two different prices or something like that. Uh, then you can use cover charge or admission fee uh, for that particular application. The next one here is recipe item. This is basically where I'm creating a recipe item on the system uh, that will be used for the uh, post inventory usage function. Okay, within post inventory usage, remember I mentioned that where you've got an all you can eat buffet, for example. And in this buffet, I say, well, I've got cold cuts and heads of lettuce and eggs and stuff like that. And these are all items that I can apply at the front end for a manual depletion of my inventory. So in here, you can create a recipe item from this uh, by choosing on that menu type. It will not be applied uh, to a conventional order. It will have no price to it, but it will be an item that can be used for the post inventory function. And finally, we have manual keyboard as well. You select on this, any keyboard will show up on the screen, and I can come in and type in a detailed message for this, such as, uh, you know, allergy, yeah, I may have one called allergy alert, and I select on manual keyboard for this. So when I select on it, it'll come up with the keyboard, and I can say nuts, or onions, or mushrooms, or something like that. In which case, then, it'll show allergy alert mushrooms, and, and that will uh, show up within the check that prints out in the kitchen, not so much on the front end. Again, this is something similar to kitchen command, only it applies specifically just to uh, remote prints as well. So that, in a really quick nutshell, gives you an idea of all the things you can do there. There are some variations of each of these as well. You will find all of those available uh, within the uh, manuals that you can play around with those. But I'm trying to fit everything in uh, within the time I've got, and there's a lot in here, so excuse me for, for slamming on through pretty quickly. All right, the next thing we have here is force questions. Now, within here, you can apply five, up to five force questions on a per item basis. So let's say, for example, within the banana split, I may want to allow them to have their choice of scoops of ice cream, flavors of ice cream. And so in which case, then, I can have a force question in here. It will automatically prompt the user when they order the banana split, then this question will come up flavor of ice creams. And in here, you can choose one, two, three, four, however many uh, would be applicable to this. So when we get into force questions, so you, you'll have a better idea in terms of the, the flexibility you have in terms of the, the, the nature of the question and so on. But in here, you can apply up to five of these on a per item basis. Now, that's not to say that you are limited to five within that based on whatever the criteria is. Let's say, for example, this banana split uh, has your choice of super salad. Okay, and so on here I would have a question in here. Would you like soup or salad? Now in that, if I chose salad, that salad item would have its own five force questions available within there. And one of those would be, let's, let's say, salad dressing. So I wouldn't need salad dressing in the master item. I would have the salad dressing available with, based on whatever I chose within that, that, that uh, force question. So you can have force questions within force questions within force questions. And I can go right on down the line on that.
Once again, if uh, your desired force question is not showing up within this list, then you can choose the little three dot box on the right hand side. And from there, I can come down to new item. And in that, it will bring up the force question setup screen. And from there, you can program these on the fly. And within that, it will be applied to the list. And then within that, you can apply it directly into the menu item. So you don't have to jump out and go back in. You can just do it right from here and add in these things as needed if need be. All right, the next thing we have here is this little checkbox. It says, ask questions at once. Now, if it's unchecked and I have multiple questions showing up, let's say with my banana split, your choice of ice cream, your choice of toppings, and your choice of, of whipped cream or something like that, then what you can, can do within this is I can have them presented, first of all, in order of, let's say, ice cream and then the... Uh, the flavor of toppings and then the little add-ons you know, with the whipped cream and the sprinkles and stuff like that and so on and so on. And they'll show up one after the next after the next. So you answer the first one, then the next one shows up. You answer that, the next one shows up. Or what I can do is I can select on this box here. In which case then if I have multiple force questions, I'll have one big window show up with all of these questions on the screen at the same time. In which case then I can say, okay, so I want the first thing it will show is my flavor of ice cream. I want uh, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. And then underneath that will be uh, your question pertaining to the the liquid topping. So I want strawberry, butterscotch, and, and fudge. And then underneath that, I would have maybe the third question with all the little add-on toppings. I'll say I want whipped cream and, and sprinkles and, and nuts uh, can all show up within there. So you can have all of these questions show up at the same time just by choosing that little checkbox there. Coming down below that, we have course. Now, depending on the nature of how you go about placing your orders on the system, you can do it in a wide variety of different ways. I can do it in order of entry, so I order this and this and this. That's the way they show up in the kitchen. I can also do it by course as well, so that my appetizers will be this, this, and this, and then my main course will be this, this, and this. My desserts will be this, this, and this. So you can place your orders that way as well. And on a per menu, or menu item basis, you can actually identify as far as which course each one of these will apply to and it will sort it out that way appropriately on the system. Also underneath that we have uh, or by seating position as well as I had mentioned earlier. We also have printing priority. We can do printing priority on a per menu item basis as well. So for example this is Scott's Ice Cream Emporium. Banana Split is my flagship item. I always want that at the top of the list so no matter what I'm going to give this one item its own printing priority of 99. So no matter what I order on the check, then the first thing that's going to show up on the prep printer will be banana split at the very top. Also, to the right of that, we have consolidate on orders as well. Now, with the network printer setup, this is where you can identify which printers will use print consolidation. Print consolidation, uh, just kind of referring back to that again, is where I've got all of these different items that were ordered on the check. So I got banana split and chocolate sundae, but it in and a blizzard and a, and, a, and a milkshake and so on, so on, so on like that. And then what I can do is on here I can say consolidate on orders, let's say with a banana splits. So this way when it prints off in the kitchen for example, then the chef will have a dotted line across the bottom of the order and then using the receipt font, the smaller font, um, it will actually show for example three banana splits two chocolate sundaes, one butterscotch sundae, something like that. So I can identify which menu items I want to use or apply to that consolidation down at the bottom. This way, if they're important items and I need to know what the quantities are to get those things made quickly, then I can just identify on a per item basis which ones I want to consolidate and include in that section. Coming down below that, we have option printing. Now, option being up here, coming back to oops, that option right here. So if this is an option, that means it's a modifier. It will function as a modifier, present itself as a modifier. If I order uh, the steak dinner with the salad, then the salad as a modifier will be indented and attached to that steak, uh, for example. And that would be a normal option. Now, we also have print always. Now, if a modifier is a zero-priced item, it will not show up on the guest check. Okay, so for example, if I order a hamburger and with cheese and I don't charge for the cheese, the cheese will not show up on the check. It will show up on the on the prep print to make sure that it's applied on there. But if the customer is not paying for it, they don't need to see it on, on the check. However, if I do want to include that cheese on the check, regardless of whether they, they paid for it or not, then I can select on print always, <clears throat> in which case then that modifier will show up on the guest check as well. We also have roll-up price. Let's say I charge 25 cents for my cheese, so I order a hamburger 
of two ninety nine, cheese twenty five cents. Now I can have it show up on the guest check as hamburger two ninety nine, cheese twenty five cents, or I can select on roll up price with for the cheese. In which case, then the twenty five cents will be added to the price of the master item, being the hamburger. So it'll be uh, two ninety nine plus twenty five cents. It'll come to three dollars and twenty four cents. Will be the price for the hamburger with cheese. Now the cheese will also show up on there, but the price of that cheese will not be separate. It will be rolled into the price of that master item. All right, the next thing we have here is custom. Over on the custom tab, this allows you to override the settings for the report category. Remember I talked about report categories where it will inherit all of this programming in terms of, of where it's going to print, the modifiers it's going to use, and the taxes it will use as well. Also the schedule, I should point that out as well. Well, if on a per menu item basis I need to override that, then I can actually do that by selecting on define custom. In which case then, now, on this particular item, I need to program in where it's going to print, what modifier pages it will use, what taxes will be applied to it, and also a specific schedule for this thing as well. Okay, so you can override that on a per menu item basis. Coming over to the right hand side, we have some additional things in here as well. First of all, minimum security. On a per menu item ba basis, I can actually apply a security level to this thing. Now, for banana splits, that's pretty straightforward stuff. But let's say this was an expensive bottle of champagne and it costs five hundred dollars for this, you know, to order this thing. Uh, I may not want just any server to go in and select on this thing. And oops, hey, I chose the wrong one. Five hundred bucks down the drain. No, you don't want to do that. So what you can actually do is, on a per menu item basis, put in a security level for this as well. If you order this item, it may come up. It requires manager authorization for you to order this on the check. The manager will come. They'll swipe their card or what, put in the number, whatever it will be, to allow you to be able to order that. So they will just uh, make sure that. It is, uh, it is applicable in that particular case. So you can apply a security level to any the ordering of any given menu item. Coming down below that, we have accounting code, cost accounting code, inventory accounting code. These are all basically general ledger account numbers for reporting purposes. So if applicable, you can populate these with general ledger account numbers based on accounting, cost accounting, and inventory accounting. Coming over to the next tab, we have recipe. So within here, within my banana split, if I am using inventory in the system, then I can select on plus inventory item. What goes into this banana split? Well, I use a couple of eggs. And I use two olives. Okay, I mean, totally not applicable to a banana split, of course. But uh, in this case, what it shows you here is that you can create uh, a recipe for this given recipe. Uh, for this given menu item. And within this recipe, you've got all of your stock items that you've created within the inventory. You'll see within here, it also brings across the cost per unit, multiplies it times the number of units as well, and then tallies all this information up and gives you a total recipe cost for this as well. So this tells you how much it costs you in, in inventory items to make a banana split. It also offers the uh, product selling price that you were charging for it and then we have suggested selling price and so within here this is kind of like a guide to help help you figure out in terms of what should I charge for this and that I can still make money on and to kind of help you with it you can scale it up and down this way so for example if I wanted my cost to take up 50 percent of what I'm actually charging I could come down to as little as 28 cents and still make a 50 percent profit on this thing you can also uh, change around as far as going with a specific percentage number this way and it would adjust the, the numbers as well. So that's what all this pertains to. This all incorporates in with the uh, uh, with the inventory system provide you are doing uh, using that. Next we have the advanced tab. Now on the advanced tab we have all kinds of information in here that you can apply uh, as well to the menu item. The first thing we have here is time to serve. Now time to serve is used when you are working with uh, types of products that use the delay print command. Okay, delay print uh, coming over to this. So what I can do on this, for example, is I can say for a banana split, it takes me two minutes to make a banana split and one minute to make a, a, a butterscotch sundae. And so in here, I can create actually a delay print item and, uh, and the, you know, just leave it as it is. And if all of my menu items have their prep time put into this thing, then when I order something, let's say, for example, all right, let's go back to soup and salad. So I, I order a soup. It takes two minutes for soup. No, it takes one minute for soup, two minutes for a salad. And so I order soup, salad. I hit delay. 
And then after that, I do my steak and pizza. Steak I can do in 12 minutes. Pizza I can do in 10 minutes. And then I hit another delay, and then I got pie and cake. So what will happen then is the system will look at the longest prep time uh, for the item above the, de the delay, and then it will delay by that period of time. So for example, soup and salad, one minute, two minute respectively, the delay will delay two minutes because that's the maximum prep time for that. Then it will print off the steak and pizza. So steak and pizza, the longest prep time will be the steak, which is 12 minutes. So the next delay will then delay 12 minutes. And then finally the pie and cake will print off. So that's one way you can do delays. Another way you can do a delay as well is if I program in a delay print function here, and rather than banana split, let's say we put in delay five, okay? No price on this, and the type of product here is a delay print command. Okay, so I get delay five on this. If I come over to the advanced tab, on that delay button, I can actually put in a five within this case. So now what will happen is you don't have to put in the prep time for all the menu items, but you have a, a variety of, of different delay buttons that you've programmed onto the system. Delay five, delay 10, delay 15, for example. And it will look to the prep time on each one of these, and I'll say, for example, delay five. So I order the soup, salad, delay five, steak, pizza, delay 15, pie and cake. So then what will happen is that the delays will delay by the designated time you put within this field here. Delaying five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and so on. It doesn't have to be five minutes. You can put in you know, seven minutes or three minutes or whatever. You can do something like that. But that's what the time to serve function does. It works in conjunction with the delay print command. The next thing we have here is ref code slash UPC. So within here, you can first put in a ref code, which, be, which is a reference code number. Now, one of the buttons that you can program into Pixel Point is a PLU lookup number. Okay, that's uh, the older system, the older point of sale systems use this. It's price lookup number. And so if I've got, let's say, for example, a wine menu, and I've got 500 bottles of wine to choose from, then I may, rather than put in 500 buttons on the system, I can just... Uh, program all those wines into the system and assign them their appropriate reference number. So I'll choose bottle number 123. So in here, I put in 123, and when you select on that PLU lookup number, it'll come up with a keypad, you put in 123, and it'll retrieve that desired bottle of wine and place that on the order. Alternately, you can also use this field for UPC code, which is the barcode number. So in here, if I'm going to scan an item, let's say for example, I've got a barcode scan on my banana split, uh, then what I can do is put in the UPC code for that. That's the numeric value of the barcode. And so when I scan it across, it will look to that field, match it up, and boom, there you go. It's, it's uh, ordered onto the system, so you can do it that way as well. Underneath that, we have number of items remaining on countdown. Okay, so this has to do with the sold out item. If I've got a limited number of banana splits in my inventory, I've only got maybe five of them left then I can put a five within, within here when I'm creating this. You would actually use this more conventionally with bottles of wine, for example. But in this, I can put in five. Now, what will happen is on the button itself, on the order screen, it will actually show a little five in the, in the bottom corner. And when I order one of these banana splits, then it will knock down to four. I order another one, three, two, one. When I order the last one, it will automatically be flagged as sold out, go through that whole process, big red X across the button, and that's the way it's done there. Coming over to the left-hand side, we have manually entered. And in here, I've got price, mode, and description. This will override whatever's on the front end and allow you to actually, uh, it'll prompt you for these, these two items. The first one is price mode, okay? So if I select on banana split, instead of being banana split, let's say it's catch of the day, all right? Typically, you go to a restaurant, they have catch of the day, and it's flagged at market price, and the market price changes on a daily basis. So in which case, then, what you can do is select on manual uh, price mode. And it doesn't matter what you've got programmed in on product setup at the front end here, the price will actually be prompted to you. A keypad will show up asking you what is the price for this item. So if I order a flounder, flounder is the, the catch of the day, then uh, the chef will take a look. Okay, I've got a great big piece of flounder here. We'll charge you know $5 for this thing. Or a smaller piece, I'll charge $3 or something like that. So when you order on a per item basis, every time you order it, it will prompt you what is the price for this given item. This is also really good for things like open bar, open food. You can use it for that as well. As an extension of that, we also have description as well. So let's say we have open food item. Okay, so just a miscellaneous thing. You know, if I got something I just brought in for the day uh, and I want to have that available in the system, then the then whatever you've got within here, it can be called open food, for example. Then it'll also come up with a keypad on the screen, allow you to type in what that given item is. So let's say, for example, I don't normally sell lobster, but today I got a, a shipment of lobster, and uh, so I'm going to sell that in my restaurant. 
So you can select on the item. The first thing it may show is the, the price mode, okay? So how much are you going to charge for this? I'll charge, uh, you know, ten dollars for this. And uh, what is the description? I'll put in the word, type in the word lobster. So what will happen is in the kitchen it will show up open food lobster ten dollars for that. That's how it will all be applied within there. Coming over to the right hand side, we have weighed item on scale. Now this is for things where you're weighing an item uh, and you're paying based on weight. Let's say for example, like a salad bar. You go to a salad bar and you're paying on the based on the weight of the salad. If I select on this and I have an integrated uh, weight scale uh, within my establishment as well, then in here, first of all, you can put in the tear weight. The tear weight is the weight to remove from whatever weight you, you, you put on the weight scale. This would be the weight of an empty plate, for example. So I've got a big plate full of salad. I place that on, on the scale. Now, the tear weight is the weight of an empty plate. I want to remove that from, from the weight so that basically I'm just paying for the weight of the salad itself. And then underneath that, unit description, pretty self-explanatory. In here you can put as far as uh, by, by ounce, by, by jar, by, by gram, by kilogram, whatever it's going to be, you can have that show up within there as well. And that's how it will be if you, you know, based on how you're pricing it. If I'm pricing it by ounce or by pound or by, 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 uh, by gram, kilogram, whatever it happens to be, then you can put all that within there. All right, um, I'll come back to these later in just a moment here. The first, uh, over on the right-hand side, we have active date range. Now, within here, I can actually have this menu. I can, I can program it in uh, for a future date, and it will not show up on the system until that date kicks in. When it does, boom, it will appear on the menu. I can also have an expiry date on this as well. So what you can do is in the system, if I have a special menu that I am programming onto the system, uh, for example, uh, we're in April right now. Let's say for May. Uh, when the month of May comes up, I want you know, this particular item to suddenly show up on the 1st of May, and at the end of May, it will then disappear from, from the screen. Then I can put in the active date range for this, and so I can program it in at any time, and it will not kick onto the system until the start date, and when the end date comes, then it will disappear. Coming down below that, we have item special. Now, within item special, this all has to do with the billboard function that shows up within the front end. Remember the three columns where you've got your dessert items and special of the day and the sold out items and so on? Well, in here, if this particular banana split is uh, something that I do want to show up as today's special, I can select on that. It will show up within the billboard. Uh, also, as a dessert as well, I can uh, select on that, and it will show up within the desserts column. Otherwise, it's just a normal item that would be normally on the menu. Coming down below that, we have report product. Now, within here, banana split is banana split. That's pretty straightforward. Let's say within my establishment, I sell Coca-Cola. Now, on here, I can create a menu item called Coke. But I can also have Diet Coke, caffeine-free Coke, uh, Coke Zero, Coke this, that, and the other thing. We've got like eight different brands of, of flavors of Coke that you can uh, program into the system. Now, when it comes to my reports, uh, if I'm looking at a product report, I want to say, well, what have I got for, for Coca-Cola sales? What you can do is you can go through and say, okay, there's Coke Zero, there's Diet Coke, there's Caffeine-Free Coke, there's Coke Cherry Coke, and all these other Cokes as well. And you can add up the numbers that way. Or what you can do is just flag them all underneath the one master item of Coke, in which case then all of those different ones, when I'm generating a product sales report, I will have a tallied group number of all of those flavors of Coke, all under the one master item of Coke, and I take a look at that. That's what I actually sold for Coke uh, for the day, regardless of what flavor it happens to be. Underneath that, we have size up product and size down product. All right, let's say, for example, banana splits come in three sizes, small, medium, and large. Then what I can do is I can program in the small banana split, medium, and the large banana split. And then within here, I can link, let's say, the, oh, well, I'll choose the middle one, okay, the medium banana split. And then I'll say size up product. So a size up product for a medium banana split would be a large banana split. I select on this, go down to large banana split. I select on it, and there is now the large banana split showing up within here. Size down product, a size down from a medium banana split would be a small banana split. So I select on this, I go into this, and I would choose the small banana split. Okay, regardless of what you actually see here. And so I have a large banana split, a small banana split. Now, one of the things you can do within Form Designer is you can program size up and size down buttons. So this way, if someone shows, let's say, a small banana split, and they say, mm, you know what, I, I like all the stuff I got on it, but um, I, I like it as a medium banana split instead. 
Well, rather than go void, void, void and take off all those toppings and the flavors and all that other stuff and then reorder the whole thing, okay, now we'll do a medium banana split with this, 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 and this, 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 and so on. What you can do is just select on the banana split and then hit size up. And it will take all uh, it will take that item plus all of its modifiers as well and size them up to a larger size and price it accordingly as well. So basically, it just it's a, a macro that will void off the one one stuff and replace it with the other stuff. And they're all linked using these things here. And so this way, let's say even with pizzas, you know, if I order a small pizza with this 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 topping and so on, then I can hit size up. It's now a medium. Size up, it's now a large. Size up, it's now a family size. And size up, it's now a block party size. And then you can go down uh, the chain as well within that. So it's just a matter of linking uh, the items based on size up and down that way. Active surcharge. Active surcharge is basically a delivery surcharge. So for example, I, I can program in not just menu items, for example, many, many other things, including, for example, a delivery surcharge. So let's say instead of banana split, this was a delivery charge. On here, I can put in whatever the programming is going to be for this delivery charge. Now let's take a look at what we have in this description here. Assign prices A through H as a percent. For example, 10 would equal 10%. Now, what this is, means is that whatever the amount of the check is going to be, then it will calculate the delivery charge as being 10% of that. So if it was a $100 transaction, then the delivery charge would be $10 for that. And if you're working with multiple price levels, if you know right now we're on price level B or, or, or D or F or something like that, then it can adjust itself uh, on, a, on a per price level basis as well, that the percentage can be different as, as well. So if I'm at happy hour, then maybe my delivery charge is actually discounted as well, and I only charge 8% uh, for that, or maybe 12%. You know, you can adjust it around that way. Now, also, when calculating this out, a couple of things here. Apply to the net total, no tax, or uh, like before tax, or apply to the final total uh, after the tax as well. So if the amount of the check is $100 uh, prior to tax, then I can select on this, and it will calculate out 10% of of $100 being $10, or apply to the final total after tax. So if it's $100 plus uh, $20 tax, then uh, it will be 10% of $120, which would be $12 as opposed to the $10. So that's how it all figures out that way. Now along with that as well, you can identify a minimum charge and a maximum charge as well. So for example, uh, let's say I put in $1, okay, so as the minimum charge, a maximum charge of $20. All right, so what that means is that if it doesn't fall uh, within within that range, then it will the minimum charge you'll be paying a minimum of at least one dollar uh, for a delivery charge, up to a maximum of twenty dollars. So let's say for example I ordered five hundred dollars worth of food, and um, and the delivery the ten percent will come up to fifty dollars in that case, but the delivery charge will max max itself out at twenty dollars maximum, in which case then it would only charge you twenty dollars for that delivery surcharge. All right, so that kind of gives you a really brief idea in terms of how surcharge works on that. All right, the last thing we got within here before we go into break is all these little boxes down here uh, within product setup. The first thing we have here is feature code. Now feature code within the system we have a whole series of different feature codes to do weird and wonderful things in the system. The most common one is feature code one which is tax inclusive pricing when when uh, when you've got a one in there. So that means, for example, banana split. If I charge $2.99 for a banana split, if I have feature code one in here, then what it will do is internally back calculate the system to add in the tax to bring it up to the price that I put in there of $2.99. You wouldn't really do that on a banana split, but you could use it on something like a bar menu, for example. Very common with that in that. In North America, commonly um, items are price plus tax unless it's liquor. If it's liquor, then the bar menus are, are typically price including tax. So if that's the case, all of your liquor items you can use uh, feature code one. You put in the, the price of the, the beer uh, or the wine or, or the, the shot, whatever it happens to be, and the system will calculate for you what the price will be to bring it up to that, and, and so you, you've used that. Uh, if you are using VAT pricing, value added tax pricing, then that's a, a change that you would make over in system setup, in which case then everything across the board is tax inclusive pricing. But if you're going to do a split between the two where you've got price plus tax and then price including tax, then you would use feature code one. We also have feature code two, which does something else, feature code three. We also have a 100, 200, 800 series and so on like that to do a variety of different things. All of these feature codes are listed within the installer's manual 
uh, in the system to give you an idea in terms of all the different functions you can do uh, using feature codes. Most common ones feature code one, but there are some other really nifty things that you can do using other feature codes as well. Coming down below that, we have tax exempt number. This is for uh, basically for reporting purposes. If this item is tax exempt and you need to apply a tax exemption GL number for uh, this particular item, you can put that within here strictly for reporting purposes only. Label capacity. Label capacity is for situations, uh, let's say for example, like a catering type establishment where I do box lunches, for example, and you have a label printer uh, where I've got a big, big uh, shipment box that's going out, and inside it contains all of these different lunches, box lunches that are going out to uh, different customers and so on. And I can fit eight of these within one box. So when I'm doing a label print on a box to identify here are all the lunches that go within this one particular box, um, then on here I can put in what is the label capacity of the of this and I would put an eight in that case and so if I had an order for 12 people and I can fit eight of these in a box then uh, actually I would have two labels print off one with a capacity of eight and that would give me the eight items in here and then the remainder being the four items would show up uh, on the on the second printout that would show up on there it's a little convoluted just to kind of explain within 25 words or less but basically this all has to do with label printing for uh, catering type applications Next thing we have here is prep location. Again, just still thinking in terms of, uh, of catering as well. If this is a particular item that uh, in a catering environment, I've got all these prep tables, prep table one, two, three, and four, where I do sandwiches in one, salads on another, desserts on another, then I can identify, okay, the banana splits will be made on prep table number three. So when I'm generating a catering type report, then I know if I've got an order for 50 banana splits, then they will all be uh, allocated across to prep table number three, which is where I commonly make all my desserts. Covers. Within covers, by default, it shows up as one. If I order one banana split, that's typically considered for one person. Now, if I have the banana split for two people, or a party banana split, or, or like a salad for two, or a dinner for two, or something like that, then actually you can change around the number on this. So if I order one of these, it will be regarded within your reports as being for two people. The next thing we have here is points awarded and employee points. Now points awarded, first of all, has to do with uh, client retention programs. Remember within clients, for every cheeseburger I order, I get 10 points, we get 100 points, I get a free cheeseburger or something like that. So in here, uh, banana splits, for every banana split I order, I get 10 points. And when I get 100, then I get a free banana split. So th the points awarded here all pertains to client retention programs. The next one down, employee points. This pertains to contests. Remember, we talked about contests in the previous uh, seminar as well, where within here, uh, for every banana split a, uh, an employee sells, then you know they get 10 points for that, and whoever sells the most banana splits at the end of the month gets a free banana split or something like that. So one pertains to members, the other pertains to employees. Finally, we have make information here. And so within this, uh, on this item, I can put in uh, how to make information for this. And <coughs> Excuse me. This information can show up um, within the front end in terms of uh, the billboard. It's available within there. There's also how to make information, which is a button that you can uh, have available within the uh, your settings screen as well. So if someone's allergic to something or they want to know how it's made, how many calories and so on, you can put that in there as well. Also, within Form Designer, you can have this information incorporated into any of the screens as well. So when I order a banana split, the Bud Light logo shows up on the screen or on the customer display, as well as uh, we have the uh, how to make information showing up within here. Now, I have three tabs available for this because I've also activated the Web2Go stuff. So if you're using Web2Go, then if I order the banana split over the web, then this is the description that will show up for this. And the long web description, if I select on that item, then the longer web description will show up within this as well. So you have uh, for web-based ordering and also just for general POS uh, applications as well, all showing up within there. And that's the to make information on that given item. Okay, we're at 11.08 right now, my time. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to pause for five minutes, allow everyone to get up and stretch and uh, have a coffee or whatever, and uh, we'll come back in five minutes, and we'll continue on with uh, these remaining tabs that we have here and the rest that we've got within product setup. Okay, so uh, actually I'm going to have to just stop where I am right now just so I can bring up my, my uh, little screen. And, uh, and so what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll uh, come back in five minutes. Just, uh, just 
leave your, your lines open. Don't worry about uh, shutting anything down or anything like that. And uh, I'll see you in five minutes. Thanks. Okay, hi folks, I'm back. And just going to get back into the system.
Okay, let's uh, continue on with where we left off. So in here, <clears throat> we finished off with the advanced tab and all the stuff that goes into that as well. So the next thing we're on to here is Web2Go Custom. Now Web2Go Custom will only show up when you activate the Web2Go system uh, on the pixel point. Uh, and that's within the uh, system setup pull down menu. Now that being said, within here, if there is anything pertaining to, uh, to certain things that may apply to uh, this item when it's ordered over the web, then you can actually change these within here. So for example, I've got banana split right now. And typically with banana splits, I have my, my certain uh, modifier pages of food holes, extra modify and stuff like that. But when it's um, used over the web, I may want to change that. Okay, when it's used through web-based ordering, I may want to have different modifiers for this particular item. Or the same applies to forced questions. I may order something, if it's ordered within the restaurant, you know, you have these force questions, but if you order it over the web, I may have additional force questions as well. So if that is the case, then you can have uh, different force questions and different uh, modifier screens that can show up for this item specifically when ordered over the web. Okay, you don't have to use those if you don't want. They they will default to the default normally, uh, but within here, uh, if you are using web to go, this tab will be made available in that case. The next thing we have here is shift products. Shift products is a type of, uh, uh, well, there's two things here. First of all, you can apply these uh, within the product setup, and then you, these are function buttons that are available within Form Designer as well. Now, let's say not so much with, with banana splits. Let's say coffee, okay? When, when you're ordering coffee, uh, coffee can come in small, medium, and large sizes, for example. Now, in older versions of Pixel Point, if you wanted a medium coffee or a small coffee or a large coffee, you had to select on the specific button to get that given item which is fine, but you know, it was very time consuming and very space consuming as well when it came to ordering these different things because I got a whole bunch of stuff that's available in small, medium, large. I mean, you have teas and coffees and espressos and cappuccinos and all these different things as well. So what you can do now is, is create shift products. This is something that's activated within policies to, to use this called use shift, use shift products. And in doing that, this, this, uh, this particular tab shows up. So what I can do now is, let's say for coffee, I can now create a single item called coffee. Zero priced item, but it's an ordering product. And then within here, I also have three my three coffees, being the small coffee, medium coffee, large coffee that I programmed into the system. But I only want the one button of coffee showing up at the front end. So what you do is within coffee, in this case, I would have within here the shift products of small, medium, and large coffee showing up within here. And, and so what happens is when you're setting up uh, your different function buttons uh, or your shift uh, product buttons, then I, ha I know that my small items will be in number one, my medium with number two, my large in number three uh, with, when you're using those. And then the function buttons that you program within Form Designer uh, for each one of these, the shift level one would be flagged as, as small. And so I would select on small and then coffee. And what it will give me is a small coffee. If I choose the medium button and then the same coffee button, then it will jump down to this level here, in which case then it will give me a medium-sized coffee. And if I chose the large one, that will now be assigned to shift level number three, and it will be named as, as large, though. And so if I chose large coffee, again, the same coffee button, then it will shift on down to this third level being the large one. Or in this case, the way I've got it is pertaining to beer, for example. An 8-ounce glass, 12-ounce glass, and a pitcher of beer. And so in a beer, beer environment, you can do the same thing. So I would have all my flavors of beer, and I could choose an 8-ounce, 12-ounce for a pitcher uh, for these, these different ones. Also down below, I did, I did some other ones as well. Let's say, for example, I'd sell submarine sandwiches, and I got the half size and the full size. So I may have a function button for you know, the 6-inch sub and the 12-inch sub. And if I chose you know, the banana split sub, then if I chose 6-inch and then banana split, then I get the 6-inch banana split sub. Uh, in, in that case. So, so you can use uh, different one of th ones of these for different things you d define in terms of which levels you want to apply them to. The next thing we have here is user definable. Remember going back where in policies I activated um, uh, some user definable buttons for things like uh, m uh, employee uniforms and so on like that. You can use it for, for uh, employee records, for stock items, and also for products. And in which case then I created this one here uh, for example, domestic and draft or bottle, you know, just ones that I was making up and so on. So in here, you can create customizable fields for your menu items as well. Kiosk forms. If you are activating kiosk applications within Pixel Point, <coughs> excuse me, 
then if this item is used in the kiosk, this is similar to what I did with, with the Web2Go custom. Uh, if it's being ordered on a kiosk, it's going to have different modify screens and force question screens. Okay, so if, if I'm ordering banana split within the restaurant, this is the normal way it's done. Uh, if I order the banana split over the web, then you can use these uh, modifier screens, special modifier screens and force screens. And if I order it on a kiosk where the, the, the customer orders for themselves, then I may have different modifier screens and force questions for this item on that as well. Finally, within here, we have combo items as well. So this is where I can go in and program combos into the system. Now, in here, I think I actually have a combo that I've uh, programmed into Pixel Point. Uh, there we go, Big Burger Combo. Okay, so here's the Big Burger Combo, and on here it's called Big Burger Combo, with whatever the price of the thing happens to be. Coming over to the combo items, the Big Burger Combo consists of a large or uh, a banquet burger, large fries, and a large soda in that case. And so in this, I programmed in these items that when you order the Big Burger Combo, the a la carte items will also show up on, this, on the printout as well, so they know, okay, that's a banquet burger, large fries, and large soda for that. And on here, I can adjust as far as the price that is applied to these as well. Right now, they're set as a fixed price of zero, but if I select on this field, I can actually change around to a different price level or a scheduled modified price, whatever it happens to be uh, for this given item. And the price on this can be adjusted accordingly as well. But on this, I can, I can designate whatever prices I, I want or just leave them at zero price because you're going to charge the overall price for the uh, combo that way. Now also, you'll notice within here as well, I've got required item, a little checkbox for that. And within here, it's suggested description. So in here, you can actually put in additional descriptions that will show up when you select on uh, any of these, whenever these items are applied within there as well. But getting back to the required item, the required item pertains to auto combo recognition. Okay, one of the things you can do within Pixel Point as well is have the system automatically recognize certain items and suggest uh, an upgrade to a combo in that case. So if I order, for example, a banquet burger and a large fries, if you activated auto combo recognition on the system, then what it will do is it will say, okay, you got these two items, you know what, that could be made into a, a combo for an additional, uh, whatever it's going to be for the, the, the price to bring it up. Uh, for that. So if I ordered the banquet burger and the combo for an extra 25 cents, I can make it uh, a, a big burger combo in that particular case. There's a lot more to it than that because there's a whole combo grid that's available within Form Designer and you can uh, have it automatically do it or uh, you can use a, a manual selection to upgrade it to a combo as well. Uh, that's, that's all within the form designer section as well. So you'll find all that kind of information in there. So I'm just quickly going through all this stuff. But basically, if you're using combo recognition, then you can apply uh, apply these things using required item, in which case then it will recognize those and from there say, okay, you can up upgrade to this combo, this combo, or this combo if you want. Also within this, when you're adding in, not only can you add in products, but also add in questions as well. So within here, uh, along with this, the question of do you want super size or large size or anything like that, you can apply uh, force questions into the combos as well. All right, so that's everything very briefly uh, under product setup. There's lots of stuff within there. And as I said, you know, there's, there's, if you want more details on any of these, because you're, you're probably spilling it with all this information <laughs> right now that I've been throwing at you, just refer to the manuals on this. If you don't find it within the back office manual, look in the installer's manual, because some of the stuff that's just outside of the box of the pro back office programming, such as feature codes and stuff like that, you'll find within the installer's manual. All right, the next thing we've got, Actually, I'm going to just, uh, well, let's, let's take a, bre a breather on the information for a moment. <clears throat> let's talk about order page setup. Okay, within, the order, uh, within the, the order screen, you have three grids. You have the product grid, the modifier grid, the order page grid. The order page grid is things like your soups, salads, pastas, kids' menu, beer, wine, cocktails, that kind of stuff. And all of those are order pages. And so within here, this is where you program each one of those order pages that can be applied within the system. But also in here, we have two different types of, of order pages as well. We have order pages, conventional order pages that show in that order page grid, and also modifier pages that show up within the modifier page grid. And uh, so within here, you can see you can identify one from the other. And when we get into menu setup, you'll see how one can differentiate from the other just to make it easier for you to identify one from you know, how one looks as opposed to the other. Now, coming into this as well, we have the description of the item, the button that you're putting in there. You press the tab key, and it will populate 
the button here as well. And along with it, just like it did in the other one, you can use grid settings or you can do it on a per uh, button basis with as far as the text alignment, the, uh, the colors that show up, an image, and also the font to be applied. And then down below, whether it's an order page or a modifier page. Now on this as well, because I activated web to go I also have web top and web bottom. These are messages that will show up at the top and or bottom of the uh, listing of all the different order pages uh, that show up with on, within the web to go screen. And that being said, you can type in a message that can show up within here, such as uh, make sure you choose this or it's only available on the, these days or something like that. Whatever would be applicable uh, if you need to put in some kind of message like that, uh, you can pop that underneath. Uh, as far as all the, the order pages that show up within there. All right, the next thing we have, let's say we did that, we did that. Report category, summer group, uh, force questions. Let's take a look at force questions. All right, so within force questions, first of all, we've got one here that says no question. Leave this one alone. The reason being is that if you ever had a force question in there and you need to replace it with a blank, you know, you need to take it out, then all you have to do is just select on no question and it will blank out the, the question that's in there and it will be a blank one. But if you did have any kind of a question that you needed to apply, then you can put this within here. Now, I'm going to actually look up one. Okay, pizza toppings is a good one. So here we have pizza toppings. And I'm going to create a force question for this. So if I order the pizza, then it's going to come up with a force question asking me, what toppings do I want to put on this pizza? Here's a list of all the toppings that I've got programmed into the system. Now, on this, the first thing we have here is the name of the force question, in which case pizza toppings makes sense. The next thing here is the question. This is the question that will show up on the order screen. What toppings would you like to select? So you can type in whatever you want on this thing, but that's that's what would show up within there. And here, here it is right here. All right, the next thing we have down here is number of choices the user may select. And what this means is what is the maximum number of choices the user can, can select in the system? You can, you can choose anywhere from 0 up to up to 10 in this case. In which case, then I can go through and I can say I want this and this and this and that and that and that. And so you can choose that up to a maximum of 10. You can put any number that you want within here. All right, the next thing we have here is the minimum number of answers required for this first question. Now, I've got a zero in here, which means if I order, a, I want just a plain pizza. I order the thing, first question comes up, I don't want any of these toppings. I just hit the OK button and it moves on from there. If I put, for example, a one in there, that means that I must choose at least one topping before I can move on. If I put in a three, that means I must choose three toppings before it will allow me to move on. Okay, so you can put any number that you want within there, but that is the required minimum number of answers uh, in order to fulfill this, this uh, first question. Number of mod price choices. Now I touched on this earlier on where we're going to use the modify price on these things. Now in here, for example, I charge $1.25 for all these things. and so. It's uh, you know if I order the pizza and then I want anchovies, bacon, and chicken, that's a buck twenty-five, buck twenty-five, buck twenty-five for each one of those. Now, if I chose num number of mod price choices is three, that means that it's going to take the first three selections that I choose and it will use the modify price for that. Now, remember on that uh, where I did that showed you the bacon and it had a, a modify price of zero. That means that on here then, if I chose uh, if I had all my my uh, toppings set up like that, where I had zero dollars for the mo the modify price, then the first three toppings would be free. Okay, so we'll choose uh, items one, two, and three. Okay, it'll use the modify price for the first three, which is zero, and then everything after that it will use the regular price, being a dollar twenty-five, dollar twenty-five, and so on. So that allows you to uh, default to that modify price in that particular case. The next thing we have here is maximum allowable splits. Now, what this means is that, and this is really good for a pizza environment, is that when you are ordering something, I may want to do like a, a half and half topping. Okay, on this half I want this, this, and this. On that half I want that, that, and that. And so if that is the case, there's actually, if you have any number greater than zero within maximum allowable splits, when the first question comes up, there will actually be a split button that will show up on the first question as well. And on there, I can select on that split, a keypad will come up, and I want to split it two ways, let's say. So I select on two. Then it will come up, split one of two. And on here, I choose my topping. So I want this, this, and this. When I'm done with that, I can select on next, in which case then it'll show you split two of two. And I can say I want that, that, and that. 
And then when you're done, you, you select an OK. And what you will have on the printout then is the big, I choose the pizza. And on split one of two, I want this, this, this. Split two of two, I want that, that, that. And this will all show up within the kitchen. So this way they know on this half, make this. On that half, make that. And the system will actually divide up in terms of the quantity and the inventory uh, uh, depletion and also the price on this as well. will all be proportional to what you're doing for this. So for example, if I charge uh, different prices for bacon on a small pizza versus bacon on a medium pizza versus bacon on a large pizza, I got different prices for these things and so on. First of all, if I use size up and down and my modifiers are linked that way as well, then the price of the bacon will be proportional to, you know, if it's a small, medium, or large. But also, let's say on a large, if I'm doing um, a half, you know, bacon on just half of it, then uh, the quantity will be one half of a large uh, bacon, and also the, the inventory depletion will be one half of a large bacon, and the price uh, that is applied to it will also be considered as one half of a large pizza. You can override that as well, again, within policies, uh, you know, if they want to charge full pop for even a half topping. But otherwise, the system will actually be proportional to whatever it is you're using on that. Now, take a look here. I've got maximum allowable splits five. That means I, I can choose a two, which can be half and half. I could choose a three, which will now divide my pizza into thirds. Or I can do it right up to fifths in this case. You know, so I can have four, you know, I can break it into quarters. I can do it even into fifths. And if you wanted, theoretically, if it was a 10-slice pizza, I could split this thing up to 10 ways. Every slice has a different flavor, has different toppings on it if you want. So it has a lot of flexibility that way. All right, coming down below that, we have allow multiple. So on this pizza, I want pepperoni, and give me some pepperoni with that. And then on top of that, give me some pepperoni. So by selecting on allow multiple, it will allow you to choose the same item more than once. Use buttons. Now, there's uh, several different ways that you can have force questions show up on the screen. One, the most common one, is by using buttons, which means a big window will show up with all of the topping buttons on there, and then you choose the different items from, from that case. Now, let's say, for example, if I had 35 different toppings that you could be applied to a pizza, well, I may not be able to fit all 35 onto the screen when I go about selecting these things. In which case then what I can do is I can uncheck this. In which case now they will all show up in a long linear format like a long list. And then from there I can choose my toppings that way. Uh, is in a list format and you can fit a lot more onto the screen that way. Uh, if you have this checked they'll show it in the button format. And then you can override how this appears as well if you decide to use the one that is available with Inform Designer, in which case you got a nice pretty screen and you can do it that way. Coming down below that, we have Substitute. Allow for substitution on this. So for example, what I can do is I can come back to this item later on after I've ordered it. I can select on it and one of the function buttons you can program in Form Designer is Substitute, in which case then it will bring up this force question again and allow you to replace the answer with something else. Uh, this is great for things, for example, if I want to replace French fries with onion rings, you can do things like that. A really good application of substitute is uh, where you're using um, entire meal ordering. This is becoming very popular now where I may choose meal number one, two, or three, and that includes your choice of, of these appetizers, these main courses, and these desserts. Now, if I chose meal number two, for example, and I want the salad and the, 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 the tuna steak and but I don't know what I want for dessert I've got a choice of three desserts then what you can do is just have one in there saying order later and so you select on that and so what it will do is send off the complete order and then when it comes time to do the desserts then we can refer, come back to that that uh, order again you can select on that and then I can choose the substitute it will bring up the fourth question of all those ones that you ordered within there and I can substitute the order later with the chocolate cake or something like that and so you can you can uh, change a force question order later on within the order by using substitute. And then finally we have automatic OK. Automatic OK is great for situations where you've, you've got a pretty, here, let me find one here. All right, I don't, I don't, I don't have some great ones here, but all right, let's say this one here. So, well, no, that, that really stinks. There we go. What flavor of beer? Okay, now in here, uh, if I had a force question, for example, and I've got a choice of two, and I need to choose one of them, rather than choose, let's say, Bud Light and then OK, 
the automatic OK will actually save me a keystroke because I know that as soon as I select one, that's going to fill this particular force question. This is really good for things, for example, like a meat temp. You know, you want rare, medium, well done. As soon as you select one, you're not going to do a steak, uh, you know, half rare and half well done. You know, you may offer, you know, the, the in betweens, but let's just say rare, medium, or well done. Uh, then in there, if you, you as soon as you choose one, you don't need to go. I'll have medium, OK, to move on. I can just choose medium, and the automatic OK will just save me the keystroke and move me on that way. Also great for salad dressings as well. I would only want sal one salad dressing. You don't really normally mix your salad dressings. In which case then, I order the salad, I choose Italian dressing, the automatic OK moves me on from there, saves me a keystroke. OK, so that's what that does. Coming over to the left-hand side, you can change around the order of these things as well, but just by selecting on the item, and then I can move up or down like this, and you can put them in any order that you want. Along with this as well, you can select on the down item, and I can change it to some other item in there. Also, coming to the right of that, we have price mode. Within here, it will default to modify price. That means that whatever the schedule price is, it will take that, but with the allowance of using the uh, number of mod price choices. But in here, if I want, I can select on this. I can force any of the price levels to show up within here as well. And as well as within that, I can use like fixed price and regular schedule pricing as well, if you're using scheduling. And <coughs> let's say, for example, all right, I'll, not, not, a, not a great one here. I'm going to go back to my pizza toppings. Okay, so on here, I got all my pizza toppings, and the world market of olives has gone through the roof. They're very hard to get. I do have some olives, but I'm going to charge you extra for it. So in this case, I'm going to go into this, and I'm going to put in fixed price for this. And for uh, if you want olives on your your pizza, I'm going to charge you twelve dollars, uh, you know, for olives on your pizza. So you can put in a fixed price like this. So whatever is honored within here, no problem. But when you come to olives, it's actually going to put on uh, $12 you know, for that topping of olives as well. So you can really be quite flexible in terms of how you want to apply your pricing to all these things as well. Um, if you have all kinds of stuff within here, then um, obviously you can add in answers, remove answers. You can change you know, the selections within here as they're already done. You can change around the order this way. And then if you've got a whole bunch, you can also sort alphabetically. You just select them like that, and it puts them all in the alphabetized order. Multi-menu setup. Um, pixel point, you can use one pixel point system for an entire food court. Consider this for a moment here. So I've got, I go to the mall, go to this food court, and I've got uh, like a KFC, I've got a Burger King, a McDonald's, a Chinese food restaurant, a submarine place, and so on, so on like this. They're all different menus, different staff, different screens and ways of ordering things and so on like that. And within the system here, you can use multi-menu so that basically you can design each one of these menus with their own different templates and the way they look and so on like that. And then on a per station basis, you can define in here in terms of which menu you're going to use on that given station. Now in here, by default, we have just one setup. Okay, and that's, that's fine and dandy as it is. But if you wanted to create additional ones for, let's say, the Burger King menu, then you can you know, select on the plus sign. There's a Burger King menu. There's a template I'm going to use. The Revenue Center it applies to. And then for the Burger King stations, you would use the Burger King menu. And so on. So multi-menu allows you to have multiple screens for these things. In a more conventional sense, uh, if you have, for example, a, men a bar menu, versus um, a, a table service menu. You can do things like that as well. So the bartenders have one screen. The wait staff, the floor staff have, have different screens as well. And you can have different menus for these things, different order pages and the way things are laid out and so on. The next thing we have here is menu setup. Now within menu setup, this is where we go about actually populating all of the contents that go into each one of these respective order screens. And so within here, the first thing we have here is all these uh, pull-down menus across the top. We have multi-menu. Now in here, if you're working with multiple revenue centers, you'll have a list here of all the different uh, revenue centers that will show up. You go down to the desired menu, uh, desired uh, revenue center, and then to the right of that, well, it'll now tree out or, or branch out to show uh, all of the sub-menus that are available within there. So for example, I may have like the food court. And I select on that, there's my Burger King menu, my KFC menu, my McDonald's menu, my sub-menu, and so on. And if I had another revenue center as well, let's say for another food court or, or a, a fine dining restaurant or something like that, I would have that uh, respective revenue center and its various menus as well. 
by selecting any one of those, that will determine what's going to show up within here, because it will pull the dimensions of these grids based on the layout of that uh, given template that you've chosen for the multi-menu. The next thing we have here is special. Uh, special is really good when you are working with multi-menus and so on like that. The first thing we have here is show products from all revenue centers. So for example, I've got multiple restaurants and I have one item of Coca-Cola. And that Coca-Cola can be bought in this restaurant or that restaurant or that restaurant. So if that's the case, you have to assign it to one of those revenue centers, but you want to make it available to all of them. You select on this and then you will have a master list of all of the items that are programmed into the system and you can use different items from different revenue centers or the same item from different revenue centers. Also sort page alphabetically as well. Uh, if for example I'm programming in cocktails, okay here's my list of cocktails right now, I select on that and I've got 200 drinks in here of the different cocktails. Obviously I can't fit all 200 onto this screen but if I hit cocktails again it will scroll down to the next group, hit cocktails again scroll down to the next group and so on. Now I go through the list, I program all these things in, but they're all over the place and I want to make it very easy to be able to find them. So I come up to, with the cocktails up on the screen, I come up to special, sort page alphabetically, so I select on that, I say, say yes, and what it will do is just alphabetize everything within here. It will maintain the position of all of those buttons, but it will alphabetize them. So you start at A and work your way down to, to Z. Next we have tag menu. Tag menu is really a nifty little function here because within this you can take common items and apply um, the, the same change to them all at the same time. So for example, within here I've got my, my cocktails right now. Let's say I want to change the colors of uh, this button. Now if I hold down the control key on my keyboard, then I can select on multiple items this way. Okay, I've just tagged those items. So I've now applied a, a selection for all of those items. And now coming to the tag menu, I can do things such as change their prices, uh, change the rep report category that, that all those items apply to. I can change the print location as well because I may want them to print to a certain, a certain printer or a certain printer channel. Um, also uh, change the tag price. So I can change a specific price level on any one of them. So I may want to change price B, for example, and make that uh, five ninety nine or something like that. And so I've applied that. All right, yeah, that, that doesn't exist. Yeah, I messed that up. Okay, because I hadn't prepared for it there. I just that's kind of going off the top of my head. But um, but within this, you can apply common changes to things like that. All right, let's come down to menu setup again. Cocktails. Here, I'll just something like that. And, uh, and in here, then you can apply, apply uh, things like that in terms of the prices, report counter, and print location. Also the tag price, the price level for that. Also the background color or the text color as well. This is really good when you're actually setting up your menus. And if you are working with the button colors, then uh, you may want to change them around you know, to whatever it's going to be. And it will be a common change applied to each one of them as well. Um, also, throw in garbage, uh, throw the tag in garbage as well. In which case, then I want to remove all those uh, ones from the item. I select on that and it will just knock them off the grid. I can also do that just by selecting on the item and just dragging it up to the trash can. It's now removed off there as well. I can move item or items around on the grid uh, just by clicking and dragging as well. And that will determine where they're going to be positioned on the thing. Uh, if I want to apply items to here, you'll see over on the left hand side I've got pages and products. Now right now I'm on products, and you'll see within here I'm working on the product grid for this thing. If I select on cocktails, here's all my cocktails on the system. And so let's say, for example, if I had the Bud Light and that I made that a cocktail, I got a Bud Light cocktail. Then I just click and drag up, and I can put it within there. The same with the Caesar salad uh, cocktail, then I can do that. And so I've got those items added in there, and again, I can move them around to wherever I want. If I wanted to make a change to one of these, let's say I've got Caesar salad selected, I choose on that. Notice up at the top here, I got Edit Product. Select on that. I'm now in Product Setup on that given item, and then within there, I can actually go in and make changes to it. Here, that's better. Sex on the beach. I I, I didn't I didn't select on that, but here I have, uh, for example, that item. I can go and make changes to it, and I've just edited that particular item. If I'm on an empty button, then within here. I can actually go into create new product. So what you can do within here, you don't have to go into product setup to begin with. You can actually go right into menu setup, select on an empty button, create new product. Here's an empty product screen in here. 
and then I can program in a menu item I want. I save it, and it's boom, it's, it's put in there right away. And it will be added to all the appropriate spots within the system as well. So from this, you can create items uh, right on the fly. You can also modify existing items on the fly. It changes based on whatever one you've selected. If you have existing ones in here, then all you have to do is just click and drag across to do that. If you want to knock them out of here, just drag it up to the trash can, and it's gone. This little lightning bolt icon here, if you want to take a look at what it looks like uh, in the front end without having to exit out, just select on it, and this will show you what your order screen looks like. And then from here, there's all my different items and how they, they will look on the system based on whatever it is you programmed in there. Okay, and when you're done with that, just a little X to take you out of it. All right, so that's how you go about programming all those things. Now, if there's a specific item I'm looking for in here, I can use the search string because these this list can get kind of long. So in here, in if I just select on, for example, S, it'll bring me down to the S's, and then an S T, it'll bring me down to the S T. There's my steak sandwich, and there I can add in a steak sandwich to the menu as well. So it's just a matter of doing doing a little search on that. Coming over to pages, take a look at the pages for a moment. Here, this is for populating this area down here. Now, the ones that are showing up that are kind of shaded. Those are modifier pages. Remember in, mod in order page setup, I was showing you uh, modifier pages versus order pages. So everything that is flagged as an order page will show up within here. All I have to do is just click and drag down. It's added into the, into the screen down here. You can also take modifier pages and put them down, but you don't really have to because they will. these are dynamic uh, changes that will be made. They're applied to the um, modifier page grid. The modifier page grid doesn't show up within here because it is dynamic, it changes. And the modifier grid, first of all, it, the template itself is applied within form designers as far as how you want that grid to look. But the contents of it change based on the report category that you set up. Remember report, report category where I choose you know, whether bar, extra hold, modifier, or food, extra hold, modify, that kind of stuff. That's all applied within, um, within report category setup so you don't populate it there. All right, now. That being said, all right, let me just bring this, this back up. Now, how do I go about populating these things if I don't actually have, if I don't drag them down here? See, if I select on any of these, all right, I got all my stuff showing up above, but how do I program in the modifiers for, let's say, food modify? All you have to do is select on food modify. Now, if I do that, take a look up at the product grid here, food modify. I don't have to click and drag it down here to actually populate it. Just select on the title, and then from there, you can actually go in and say, okay, coming over to products now, the sea bass dinner is now a food modifier, as is the sausage and the pineapple. Okay, so you can do things like that and populate your food or, or any of your modifier screens that way just by selecting on the title of it. Okay, so that's that's all that in a really quick nutshell. Uh, let me see, tag, we got all that. And I, yeah, I think we're done with all that. So that's how you go about setting up uh, your, your screens for that. One more thing I just want to show you before we finish off with that. So let's say the sea bass dinner. Uh, on this, I've got it added in here. Maybe I just created it by selecting on an empty one, create new, and then I programmed in uh, the sea bass dinner. If, for example, there was a forced question that I forgot, oh man, I forgot that uh, I need to ask, you know, what end of the fish you want to eat or something like that. Then, and I don't have a forced question for that. Then you can actually go into here. And I can actually go into new and come up with force question, create the force question, save that. From there, it's in the list. You select on the list. It's applied within there. You've got that all done within there. I save that, and I'm back to the menu again. So you, these are all linked together. It's all interactive that way. It's just a matter of making sure you keep track of where you are and not losing yourself within there. All right, the next thing we got down here is configuration setup. Now, configuration setup is something that you probably don't have within your POS right now. The reason being is that it's actually activated within policies. There, if you do a search in there for configuration, there is a thing called configuration categories. And in there, you can actually uh, activate that in the system, and this will show up within here. Now, a configuration category is basically it's a sub uh, report category. Okay, so for example, I've got a report category of salads. And in my salads, I may have um, fruit salads and vegetable salads. So, you know, I may want to break it off that way, for example, for reporting purposes. If that is the case, then in here or items, I can have like hot and, and cold, for example. So I can have a sub-report category set up for this and activate this within the system if they need that extended reporting capability. And in here, you create all of your different uh, configuration categories. On here, I put in as far as what the particular item is, the revenue center it belongs to. And then in product setup, I actually go in and I, and I tag as far as which configuration category it will belong to.
or is that within report category? I think it's within report category. Coming down below that, we have uh, the settings, first of all, the print location. So I can have, for example, I may have a hot printer and a cold printer. If I order a salad, but I have hot and cold salads or hot and cold soups or something like that, then actually you can have them split off using the configuration categories. So you still have them all printing to the kitchen, but from there, one to a hot printer, one to a cold printer. And you can define as far as which channels it will be for that. Also, within here, the modifier screens may be different on a per cag, uh, configuration category basis, uh, where one would have certain modifiers, another would have different modifiers, or taxes may be different as well, so you can do things like that. And of course, scheduling, once again, you know, I may have uh, a happy hour for cold salads, but not for hot salads, or something silly like that. So you can actually go in and do some special scheduling on this. Everything you can do basically within a report category setting, you can do within a configuration category setting as well. It's just you're breaking it off further and they're being associated to their respective report category and report category setup. But these are not available by default. You have to activate that within policies. Finally, oh, we have refund reasons. All right, this is the last thing we're going to cover within the back office. And within here, whenever you're doing like a void or a refund of some particular item, then you have a, a list of selections that can come up within here. And this is where you go about programming in all of the different ones that may be available, such as a complimentary item, you know, if management uh, decides to choose that, or an item coupon is presented or was presented on this, or a kitchen complaint or a service complaint, something like that. Wait, wait staff error, they, they made a mistake in ordering or something like that. So you have all of your different ones that you can program within here. Now, within this, we have three little check boxes. The first one being reduce inventory. Now, in this particular case, all right, let me just uh, choose white staff error. All right, so for example, I ordered a, um, a plate of spaghetti. You ordered lasagna, I gave you spaghetti. You, and you sent this back and say, hey, I ordered lasagna, you gave me the wrong dish. So in this case, if I do bring the spaghetti back to the kitchen and I have to void it off, then uh, I would select on this wait staff error. It was my mistake. And if that's the case, reduce inventory. I will not be putting that cooked plate of spaghetti back into inventory. Now, if it was a hat that I, I uh, was returning back, for example, I, I, I got a size small and it should have been a size large, then the hat you can put back into inventory and it can be resold. But if it's a plate of spaghetti, you wouldn't do that. So if it's selected on reduce inventory, it, then basically it's waste. It will, it will be thrown out. Uh, if it's uh, unchecked, then that item will be put back, the inventory of that item will be put back into inventory again, and it will replenish that once again. Print refund on receipt. Okay, so within this, if it was a complimentary item, that's always a nice thing to put in there. Hey, we gave you a complimentary uh, plate of lasagna. Uh, so you may want that, in, that description included in there. Uh, if it's unchecked, then it will just not be in there, and you know, the, the check will show you know, with, if, the, if something was voided off or, or removed from the thing, then it will not be in there. But if you want to identify that it was removed, then you can check on this box. Print refund on print channels, okay? Printer channels being the remote prints. And so in this case, uh, if there was something as far as like a, a food complaint, you may want this to, sh you know, select on that, and have that show up in the kitchen that, so that the kitchen staff know, hey, I've got a plate of, of spaghetti or a plate of lasagna that's being sent back because it was not well done. It was not properly cooked. So in that case, I can have that particular complaint uh, to show up on a print channel, and that will print off at the respective location for that item. And then finally, we have minimum security required. So within this, if it's a wait staff error, you know, hey, all right, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I'll select on wait staff error. Boom, it's voided off the system. But for something like a complimentary item, for example, you may not want to be able to allow regular wait staff to select on that particular selection. So in this case, based on whichever answer they choose within here, uh, the system may prompt them for manager authorization or not. And that's it. Everything underneath the, the sun as far as front end and back end for, uh, for the Power Pixel Point system. Um, so we've gone through 12 weeks of all this stuff, and uh, 11 of those sessions are posted on the MyPAR website. This is session number 12, and uh, by tomorrow I will have uh, the recording of this entire session posted on there as well. I do have five minutes left, and so what I'm going to do right now is just... Sorry about that, I hit the wrong button. And so on this, I'm now going to open up as far as questions go. If anyone has any questions, uh, this is a good time to actually uh, go ahead and... Uh, and ask away. So we've got a couple of minutes here if anyone has any questions uh, pertaining to pretty well anything. Now this is not free support. 
Okay, so please make it pertaining to whatever this uh, this uh, training has been. But if you have any questions, it's a good time to ask. Okay, so I have one up on the screen here. When you add a surcharge to an item, does it show up on the guest receipt? Yes, it does. And actually, it's not to a specific item. It's to an entire check. Okay, so if I'm using um, a, a surcharge, for example, that will apply to the calculated total of the entire check, Ed. And so um, if it's a delivery surcharge, for example. Now, I can actually, a couple of things here. Uh, one thing I kind of touched on briefly uh, was feature codes. You may recall that I actually did feature codes on that. One of the feature codes that you can apply in the system is feature code 101, for example. Actually, 101 to 104 will auto order item. This is a really nifty thing. So I can create a delivery surcharge, for example, and I can, <clears throat> if all I do is deliveries, then I can actually put in feature code 101. It will automatically order the delivery surcharge. It will calculate out the surcharge based, or the delivery charge, based on the contents of the order that way. So it's an automatic order item. Or because you've got sale types, you can actually auto order item within that. I can go specifically to delivery in that case and auto order item the delivery surcharge, which can be applied within there. But the delivery surcharge does apply the surcharge does apply to the entire check in that in that case. If I am all right, here's another one here. We have if I am selling fish only on Fridays, do I have to reset the active date range, uh, let me see, every every week in order for the item to be active during the rest of the week. Okay, <clears throat> as far as the active, uh, the active date range, I really wouldn't use it for something like that. What you can do is use the schedule function that's available within product setup. Remember, you go into the custom tab and you can select on custom and put in on just the fish, for example, you can use the schedule in that case. And whenever it's not available, you just blank those out using the not available item uh, within that schedule, in which case then the fish will not be available and it'll only be available within the desired uh, dates that you want to have it uh, in there. Okay, going once. Going twice? Ah. <laughs> Thanks, Phyllis. Okay, I guess we're done. All right, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and attention uh, throughout these uh, 12 weeks. As I mentioned here, that uh, I will be posting this last session onto the MyPAR website as well. Later on this year, I'll be going through this process all over again, but I will be retaining all of the recordings of this and uh, making them readily available. And also, uh, time permitting as well, I will be actually doing some proper recordings to get these things up to date as well, so that you have a little smoother flow than uh, hearing me stumble through things and having things not work when I kind of wanted them to. Uh, but in any case, it's been a lot of fun doing this, and uh, thank you very much uh, for taking part in it. And I hope you find it very useful, and I wish you all the best in your endeavors with the PowerPixel Point system. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day.